Well, Jim, before we do any more singing, something is making the rounds right now on that's, social. That's my gardeners now. They've just showed up. Oh, is that what I hear? Yeah. The listeners always complain they don't hear anything because we well, do such a good job. You, you have you have Kippelman and J Shark NATO and all these other people filtering these things. Jim, apparently, and I'm not sure what the source is, but it's been sent to me by a few people here. It has now been released on social media, the memo that Linda McMahon issued in 1996, telling staff that there'll be no more food, water, insurance, <laughs> photocopiers. Have you seen well, now, this? Wait a minute. Hold on. What's the date on it? Uh, there is not... A date. Let me uh, double check. There's not because a date. Because if there, then that I believe that it was 1995. If we're trying to be uh, strictly uh, copacetic here, as Mama Cornette used to say, I believe that came out in the latter stages of 1995. Do but go a, ahead. Do you have a copy of this? No, I don't. Because that's what I'm saying to you is, is that when I joined the office in early 96, there was still conversation about what had gone on and the fact they took the water coolers off the fourth floor. But I, I heard about, if this is the, the incident that I'm thinking about, remember the one where Lord Al Hayes said, well, fuck it, I quit, right? That when, when, they, when yeah. they cut all of the, because the way I understand it, they didn't cut the employees' actual, like, salary. They may have taken the water coolers out and cut benefits or closed the gym early or whatever. You're going to read us this. But the, the wrestling side, they actually, like Bruce Pritchard, Pat Patterson, Lord Al Hayes, J.J. Dillon, they cut their salaries. J.J. seemed to indicate it was about 30%. And he had come up there in that overpriced hellhole, Connecticut, as JR termed it, and everybody termed it, because it was like fucking living in Fort Knox. You know, he couldn't make it. That's when he, Lord Al Hayes, decided to quit there and then, and that's what motivated JJ to quit toward the end of 96, because he had to sell the house that he had bought there, and he had to make sure that he didn't get stuck with a house and no job and all that stuff, so it took him a year for him to get out of there. But this was what instigated these things. And I believe that was right before, because when I went, I didn't know how much the office people, the creative team, whoever in WWF made at that point. And as I've mentioned, I didn't, I never asked for the job. I went to Vince in early November of 95 saying that, you know, things were not good in Tennessee and I was going to have to probably close Smoky Mountain down by after Thanksgiving, if not by Christmas, you know, unless something happened, thinking that he might try to throw me a bone like he had done Heyman when he took a bunch of the talent um, just to keep things going because I'd fed him a number of guys. And he double-crossed me and didn't offer to give Smoky Mountain any money. He offered me a goddamn job. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. So where was, was that discussion? Um, in November of 1995, where did we, at the beginning of that month, where did we do television? So that's what I meant. It was at the arena. You, you weren't even yeah. in the office yet at this time. No, no. I'd never seen Titan Tower at that point. It was where we were either the end of October or first week of November when we did television, wherever it was in the TV arena. You ever feel ripped off that you didn't get the experience of being picked up in the limo and either brought to the tower or brought right to Vince's house to meet him when you first come in? Well, no, they, he did that in 86, remember? When the midnight and I went up there. But the thing is, because it was a secret meeting, we didn't go to the office or his house. We went to a hotel in Stamford uh, that he got us a room just so we could talk and have lunch brought up and everything. But we got the limo from the airport to the hotel and then back again. And he pulled up in that I have no idea what kind of car that was that he had back in those. This was 1986, but it was like a 1930-something Rolls-Royce-looking fucking thing that John Steed would have driven in the Avengers with no top on it. It looked like it had to be a $500,000 fucking show car or something. That's not the car he's in in those photos with him and Hogan, is it? 
you know what? It may very well be. He drove that up to the front of the fucking hotel. Was he wearing a suit? Yes. Oh, yes. One of of his announcer suits from the 80s. Well, let's get to, uh, speaking of his announcer suits from the 80s, let's get to Linda's letter here. To the mailing list of everyone, the subject, a memo from Linda McMahon. Here are the message contents. To all, I caught Vince with moolah again last night. Oh, come on. I'm taking half of everything and selling it to the Saudis. (laughs) Over the last few weeks, we have had many meetings and discussions about our profit improvement plan, and we have received many good suggestions, which we will continue to evaluate. However, the following suggestions we are going to implement immediately. Number one, telephone. Effective today, everyone will be responsible for all personal long-distance telephone calls. At the end of each month, you will receive a call listing for all long-distance calls made from your extension. Please review it and send your check made payable to Titan Sports to accounting. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Did you have to do that? (laughs) Um, No, I never... Fuck it. I had an office in name only. I barely ever made any phone calls out of it either. I was almost never in it, but go ahead. Must be wonderful working there and then writing checks to your employer. When when Bruce when JJ left and Bruce became uh, vice president of talent relations for a brief time and turned into Adolf Pritchard, uh, he brought in this paperwork one day and he said, "Here, I said, what's this?" He said, "It's your call logs." I said, "What?" He said, "You need to write down every time you make a phone call, who you call." how long you talk and what the take notes on the, the topic. Like if you're calling the third party promoters or you're calling the talent or whatever, I say, you, are you out of your fucking mind that besides the fact that I'm already talking to these people to begin with, and that takes time that I'm going to, you think I'm going to sit down and write all that shit down? Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to have to do them. Okay, here you go. And I threw them in the drawer and I never saw them again. Go ahead. Number two, Crystal Rock Water. We will discontinue the purchase of bottled water at Titan Tower and at the distribution center when the water supply we have in-house is depleted. (laughs) Fill your canteens now. Over the next few weeks, we will... Hey, 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 say, let me me preface this. Remember, I've told... I've told everybody how how times have changed that Vince McMahon, for the first year... 96 that I worked for him talked about how that he lost five million dollars out of my ass last year and and he complained about that and that this is the result of all of that this is what happened as a result of that I should say that he was chapped and now he spends that to get laid go ahead over the next few weeks we will install drinking fountains at TV and phase out the bottled water at that facility also. So when they say TV, they're talking about the studio. At at TV, they're talking about the TV studio on Hamilton Avenue. Three, cafeteria. We have attempted to change the service and at least break even, but we have been unsuccessful. As of Monday, we will discontinue our cafeteria service. The lunchroom will be open, and soon we will provide more vending machines for you to use. <laughs> so no more fresh now, food, but please buy a candy bar. Well, hold on now. I will tell you that apparently there was such blowback on that. By the time that I got there, they had opened the cafeteria back up because the guy, wow. I can't remember what his name was, but the guy that ran it, that cooked there, and I guess he ran the thing, used to love seeing me come in because everybody else was coming in and ordering wraps and salads and turkey sandwiches or whatever trying to eat healthier be like vince now went to the fucking gym that they had there and everything i'd come in i'd either get the a double order of the chicken fingers with double ranch or the goddamn double cheeseburger with extra cheese and the, the smell of frying would fill that whole room and you would see tables of people getting up and physically looking like they're going to be ill and leaving whenever i'd come in to eat there and it was like three days a week for a while it was great Four, security. We will eliminate the security at Titan Tower and the TV facility 
effective at the end of today. <laughs> a receptionist will be at the B-level lobby and at TV's lobby to greet our guests. To greet our guests and to attempt to keep out the people that apparently armed security were necessary <laughs> for. And again, this is Stamford, Connecticut. And you would think, oh my God, Titan Tower would be in a great neighborhood. Literally, the other side of the street can be a bad neighborhood in that town. And when they put me up at the condo that they got me for the first four months until, you know, I could find a house up there. And we've told that story too how much the house, houses cost, but the doorman was like, at the condo was like now, because it was right across the street from a big shopping mall. And, you know, you would think, well, you can just walk across the street and you're in the mall. You go through the parking garage in the mall and then you go to the elevator or whatever. But the doorman said, no, don't, uh, if it's after dark, don't walk across this, get us to walk you across the street and, and get you in the elevator. What? Well, it's not okay. I just won't go over there after dark at fucking all. Continue. Number five, Federal Express. It doesn't absolutely positively have to be there overnight. We have seen a dramatic reduction in Federal Express, but there is still room to improve. All requests must absolutely be necessary. Jim, how often when you worked in the office did you use Federal Express? Or FedEx as we know it now? I never sent anybody anything from that fucking office. It wasn't my job, man. Every time I ever hear anyone talk about getting anything from Vince, it's always like, yeah, they FedExed me something. Yeah, well, that was... <laughs> you know what? I swear, I think... Did I hear a story at one point that the fucking somebody on the second floor FedExed something to somebody on the third floor just to be a smartass? I hope Linda didn't find out. Number six, spending authority. Beginning today, I am instituting a radical new procedure for expenditure approvals. A table of authority, which indicates who is authorized to spend the company's funds, will be <laughs> circulated to everyone. Let me stop there. That's fascinating. A table of authority, <laughs> which will show who can spend the funds. And then the, there, there was the there was the other end of the the equation. There was the chair of irresponsibility, where if you spend an irresponsibility, you would get hit over the head with a chair. In the past, department heads were permitted to sign contracts, purchase inventory, and commit expenditure dollars without senior management approval. All such items and all monies to be spent, regardless of the amount except as indicated on the attached, must be approved by Doug Sages or myself. Check requests and or purchase order must be completed. This process will be refined as we proceed, but I'm convinced that we will be better able to harness our spending with this procedure. Spending authority, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, the Port Authority was over the spending at one point, and then the Chicago Transit Authority took over from there, and then there was a place in Dallas that I used to enjoy called Pizza Transit Authority, where they delivered pizzas. Did you like Pizza Inn? No, I like Pizza Out, Pizza Inn. It doesn't matter. We can bring it in. We can go out and have it, whichever. Did you ever have spending authority while you were there? Uh, No. Well, actually, I had to pay for lunch at the cafeteria, but <laughs> Vince would pay when we were at his house on Wednesday's writing. He'd take us down to the little store and buy our lunch. Number seven, Kodak copy machines. <laughs> we have evaluated our usage and found that a number of machines are significantly underutilized. As such, we will be eliminating some of the machines in the near future. That will mean that the machine locations will be less convenient for some of us. This is a guy that 15 years later would spend $20 million for pussy. And he was mad because we were using too much ink in the Xerox machines. Number eight, insurance benefits. One idea that continually surfaced in our meetings to save costs would be to have employees contribute 
to the cost of our medical insurance. Effective December 1, we shall change our policy to reflect those costs. During the following weeks, we shall provide you with various coverage options. Do you remember anything about this after you got there? Um, well, honestly, again, it was, what was it, 90, I came in because I was still on a talent contract, and then they gave me a contract uh, to be on the creative team, but I was not an employee until the following year, where at that point, for about two weeks, I was an employee because Vince had taken me off of managing, and I was just doing the creative team. I've told this story before, so I'll try to gloss over it. So at that point, they said, well, we'll just make you an employee. And because they had uh, originally, uh, they were going to make me an employee, but because the talent contract, a talent couldn't be an employee at the same time. You see what I'm saying here? So they started paying, re they got me insurance and reimbursed me for it. I got health insurance, life insurance, and something else, and they took out the policy, and they would cut me a check every month for the premium that I paid. And then for a year later, they said, well, we'll just make you an employee, and we'll have to stop jumping through all these hoops. And I was an employee for about two weeks, and then Vince sent me out to kill some time on the microphone and take a bump for the baby face, and the lawyer, Ed Kaufman, got panicked over that, said, you can't take bumps, you're an employee. I said, well, I never said I was going to quit doing anything. Unmake me an employee. and Go back to the old deal. And then went back to the old deal. You're fired. Go out there and do your thing. Yeah, there you go. So that, so I don't know what the, actually the insurance is. The only time I've ever had a job where I had insurance to begin with, unless I got it myself. Number nine, temporary personnel. We shall eliminate temporary personnel, but under extreme situations, will be evaluated by Lisa Wolf. <laughs> Full-time personnel will need to be allocated on a priority basis. Freelancers. I, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just about to say, uh, that's, you know, basically, I guess they were calling in too many extra, what are the, what they used to call them, uh, um, oh my God, there was some sexist condescending name for the temporary secretary service they used to have vince's girlfriends no oh, god damn it that was the illegal paralegals um it, like meter maids but um oh god I there's can't no meter well exactly this was back in like the 50s get one of the uh the 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 something girls or whatever i'm dying to know what it is now they were temporary secretaries it's what they were, that you could just call up and they would send you one. Number 10, freelancers. Except for remote television shoots, the use of freelancers will be eliminated. Again, personnel will be cross-trained so that departments can work to assist one another when necessary. So how about that? Linda McMahon inventing cross-training. Well, there you go. And she, and she always was in good shape. And I mean, a lot of this... I mean, not the minute stuff like the no more bottled water and all this other shit, but they did and they went back to it as soon as they started making money again. The WWF always had a habit of just spending money when and having multiple people doing shit. And then I came from the exact opposite where, especially in Smoky Mountain, but in any type of regional territory wrestling, people did six or seven different things. So I was used to that. I was kind of stunned when they had people just doing one particular thing up there. Number 11, overtime. The company will no longer pay OT for anyone who works through their lunch hour. <laughs> All OT costs will be reevaluated. Was that a common issue there? I see again, I wasn't on the, I was over on the side of the building that, Never got overtime to begin you with. You wish you so, had a clock. <laughs> yeah, boy, if I'd have had a fucking clock on me in the wrestling business rather than a calendar, because it's it's like we worked daily, but for 20 hours instead of eight. Go ahead. And finally, number 12, email. Our goal is to discontinue paper memos and to use email. The email system 
is very convenient and efficient. <laughs> this is only a start. Please continue with your ideas. Work efficiently, plan, and don't be wasteful. I expect there will be some glitches, but only temporarily. Thank you. I'll be in Florida with my pool boy. <laughs> Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. <laughs> Linda McMahon. Okay, and also the email when I got there and they gave me the office, right, is uh, right across the hall from Finkel and uh, and diagonal from Jim Ross. Um, th th there was a computer. The only thing in the office was a desk, a chair, a computer of the time. Imagine 1996 computer, the big bulky square thing, right? And this framed picture of Vince, it's a framed like 24 by 36 poster of Vince doing his announcer pose from the 80s. And that was leaning up behind the door. And otherwise, completely empty room. And I said, when I leave, eventually I'm taking that picture with me. And I did. It's hanging on my wall behind me right now. But they said, well, you got to, you know, we're communicating by email. I said, what the fuck is that? Right. And they showed me. And especially because... <laughs> It's easier now, but but you remember back then, the fucking way the screen looked, and it was just like, you know, you were playing Pong and typing at the same time. And I said, I'm going to hate this. So I sent an email, because they gave me an office email address. I sent an email to, oh, God, what was the lady's name? It was head of human relations, human resources, whatever. But I sent that, and I sent it to... Nicole, one of the secretaries, and Beth, Vince's secretary, they included everybody so they see. I know how to send the email. I never fucking sent another email the whole time I worked there, another three years. Vince wasn't emailing. He wasn't emailing to us. We had to sit across from him and with our books and our pencils and write down shit that he said. So, and then if there was something that everybody needed to know, when JR took over talent relations, he would just have a memo copied and put in all of our boxes, me included. So I didn't have to worry about looking at the goddamn email. Obviously, this came from Linda and Vince's good time Charlie, as we all know. Did Linda have a reputation around the office as being, you know, someone you didn't want to mess with or stern or anything? Well, no, not Stern, somebody you didn't want to mess with. I mean, obviously, for fuck's sake, it's not only Linda is in charge of the business side of the company, but it's Vince's wife. So obviously, you don't know, fuck with her. She wasn't a stern woman. She wasn't, she wasn't going down the hallway laughing and slapping her knee and telling stories and speaking loudly. She, like she was on TV, she's very reserved and quiet, polite. Um, you know, no outrageousness to her or whatever, and very kind of, I mean, stick in the mud kind of businessy. That's why she ran the business side. And you went over there to that other side of the fourth floor. I was over there like twice. It just, uh, I don't even know why. In her office, just the outer office, actually. It was even more opulent and more like a lawyer's office than Vince. She didn't have a dinosaur fossil on the wall or the weird colors or some of the things up on the walls that Vince had, but it looked like you were walking into, you know, a, a big time corporate lawyer's office over there. That, cause that's where they entertained the business people and they hired all the people over there and that worked in the company that didn't have anything to do with wrestling, marketing and merchandising and whatever. And that was a whole different side. And then they knew that if they came to that, particular what was it the i guess it'd be the northeastern corner of titan tower on the fourth floor that was where you might find jim Cornette and fucking jim ross and howard finkel and vince mcmahon and bruce pritchard and jake snake roberts or michael hay or those lunatics that you can hear coming a mile away and you're going to hear some kind of profanity coming from doors and there's going to be some kind of craziness going on so most of the normal people only came over there when they had business transact.